Mm -hmm. Vale. Ok, um, so the last, um, the last thing I want to tell you about is um, visualization. Um, so this goes again into the trend of trying to understand what the neural network is doing. And this is actually very useful for you if you're training your first neural network, you get some result and you don't really know what's happening. Um, so there are certain visualization techniques that can actually help you to understand what the network is focusing on, what are the features that the network is extracting, and are these good enough or not? And so um, there are, whoa, okay, okay, okay. Um, okay, so um, there's, um, there are several ways of visualizing um, convolutional neural networks. I'm only going to talk about convolutional neural networks. Uh, and uh, people have tried visualization, uh, visualizing uh, features, activations, uh, TSNE visualization that you have probably heard of, and then doing fun stuff like, for example, the deep dream. Um, so I'm just going to keep talking until it's 7 p.m. If that's okay for you, and then let's see let's see how much we can do. Um, so again, this is this is about understanding CNNs, right? So I don't want to visualize to get nice pictures, like, like for example in, in the image synthesis case, but I do want to understand what is happening inside my CNNs. Um, so the very easy first test that you can do is actually what is called visualization in the image space. So in this case, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to um, pick one layer. So let's say I want to visualize uh, the first layer here. So I'm going to pick one particular unit in one particular layer. And I'm going to find the image patches in my data set that actually man maximize this unit's activation. So this is like the simplest thing that you could actually do. And so uh, what I'm going to compute is I'm, I'm going to compute um, which image gives me the maximum activation. So let's say the, the white pixel in this case. And I'm going to see what kind of images do I get from that. And so um, if I do actually this test, for example, for uh, feature map one of layer one, I obtain nine image patches from all my training um, images. And I see that, for example, all these training patches have one thing in common, which is this um, diagonal feature here. So with this, you can already imagine that uh, for feature map one, layer one, this is going to be sort of a diagonal edge uh, detection, detector. Now, if I do the same, of course, with another feature map, again, in the first layer, then I can observe that the diagonal has changed. It's also sort of a, of a triangle in some points. Um, so with this, you can actually debug, for example, what is layer one doing? What is um, layer one um, actually trying to detect? And you observe um, different um, channels of layer one, and you see that the, they focus on different types of image features, going to from um, the edges to something uh, smoother, like, for example, these green patches here. Um, now, if you go to layer two, things start to get more interesting. So, of course, uh, your patches have grown bigger because your receptive field has grown. So now you can see um, more meaningful parts of the image. So we're not talking about um, simple edges, but we're talking already about um, textures and these like circular things, um, something like eye type of shapes. So you can see already that this layer um, starts to get more and more meaningful information. And for example, um, we can actually zoom in some examples of layer two and we can see, for example, this eye type of structure that always appear in all kinds of neural networks that you train. And uh, for example, this, this type of textures like vertical lines that you also see. And things start to get more interesting when you go into layer five, right? So here your receptive field is already quite large. So you can already start seeing parts of objects and you see, for example, this sort of typewriter structure and also like coffee grinder, water, shower, um, head, um, versus another, um, another channel that is actually in charge of detecting these, um, these signs. So if you see this type of structure in your neural network, then you can assume that your neural network has been properly trained because you see these nice clusters. Each layer is focusing on a different thing. So this is one very easy way um, to actually um, see that your neural network is performing the task correctly. And in this case, you can already see um, that it's, it's going to be a pretty good dog versus flower classifier. 
Um, so this is pretty much the simplest thing you can do. If you see nice cluster, dogs are with dogs, flowers are with flowers, means that your network is properly trained. Um, but we're going to, to look at some more um, interesting visualizations. And one thing that you can do is actually um, to visualize importance. So to visualize which part of the image are more important for, for example, your dog classifier. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, do what is called the occlusion experiment. So this was presented also in, in this EC 2014 paper. And what they propose actually is um, to block different parts of the image and see how the classification score changes. So let's say that we get this uh, image of this nice puppy. We run it through our classifier. Our classifier says that this is the dog. And we're happy with the, with the decision. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take the same image, but we're going to block it somewhere. And this actually changes um, the score not too much, right? Because, I mean, it's blocking some part of the glass. So the features of the dog are still um, quite there. But if we block the face of the dog, then uh, we would expect that um, the classifier is less confident about this, um, this classification. And again, confident now is in the softmax sense, so we're not going to go into the, into the Bayesian deep learning, but just what is the score that we get out of the softmax layer. And we can see that if we block the face of the dog, then um, this score goes down quite a lot. So of course we can infer from this that the face of the dog is more important for um, the correct classification. And we can also draw a map from this. So what we can do is that um, centered on each pixel, we put one of these gray blocks on top of the image. We run it through um, the neural network classification and we get this output, this softmax output, which we actually interpret then as a probability. And if we do this, actually, we see that whenever we're blocking parts of the dog face, we're actually, actually our classification score drops down quite a lot. And so we can actually infer that this part of the image is very, very important for our classifier. And this actually works pretty well when you have usually uh, one or two objects in the scene. If you have a landscape, things start to change. But here, for example, when you have um, the car wheel um, label, you're trying to get it and you're blocking the car wheel, of course, the score goes down. So this is the important part of the image. And if you're trying to detect this dog here, then the persons are not so important, but the region where the dog is is actually really important. So again, um, the, the pixels in blue have the lowest score for this particular category, and so they are the most important for classification. Yes? Um, that's a good question. I don't know, actually. Um, I would assume it could happen because neural networks are funny like that. Um, but I would not say this is a standard thing. And I don't, I would not actually dare to say what it actually means um, if a part of the, of the image is covered and it improves the results. I would not dare to say what that actually means. So in these cases, it doesn't, right? So this is the, um, the, the maximum classification is actually kept. So the graph is kept at the maximum classification. So when you're blocking, are you turning that area of the pixels to zero, or are you adding a filter or something that's nearby the, what's around that filter? So, um, I mean, there are several ways of doing it. So um, usually you put this gray mask on top, which is basically um, taken from the mean image of your, uh, of your data set. Uh, but some people say that this is not natural. I mean, if you look at this image, you will never have an image with the, this gray block in the middle. Uh, so some people have um, thought about doing some sort of smarting painting that actually impaints something on this region that is not a dog but a cat, for example, and then seeing what happens. So that you still have a natural image, but you can compute this kind of, um, this kind of result. Uh, but this is sort of like more advanced work. Here you just put a gray block and you pass it through the network. Um, so this also works quite well, again, if you are performing a classification or object detection and if you have um, few um, objects in the scene. 
So we have tried it for other classes of, of images where you have, for example, buildings and you want to know which part of the building the network focuses on. And this actually doesn't work so well. So this is, um, I would say it's quite targeted to, to specific objects that are quite big in the image. Um, so probably the most, the most prominent way of, of visualizing is actually to directly visualizing the features. And you will have most likely already seen um, the kind of, um, of images that I'm going to show you. And um, the idea here is that um, you have this confnet that takes you from image to feature representation, and then you have what is called the deconfnet that uh, would take you from feature representation to image. So again, this is not an autoencoder type of image. Um, this is um, a deconfnet, so it tries to undo the operation that was done in here. So it's not a generative model. And what you can do actually with this is um, you can use the deconfnet to actually visualize the features at a certain layer. So how you do it is you take um, your training image, you pass it through the network, and you stop at a certain layer. You get all the activations from this layer, and then you switch to the deconfnet to actually upsample back to the image base. And then you observe whatever you get from there. So effectively, what you're going to be observing is the activations in this particular layer where you stop your forward pass. So again, um, how, this, how this actually works step by step is um, you take your input image, do the forward pass, then you decide what kind of filter, what kind of layer um, do I want to actually observe. So I choose, for example, filter 15 of the third layer because I see that it's highly activated by this image. And then um, you actually want to visualize this filter. So you zero out all the other filters to amplify um, the response of this filter. And then you pass um, the whole activation block through the deconfnet. And you see what you get um, as an output in the image. Yes? Um, I'm glad you asked this question. Um, so this is a deconfnet. Um, so essentially what the deconfnet is meant to do is it's meant to sort of um, undo the confnet operation. Um, so it's not um, a really proper deconvolution, but the approximation that you can get from it and one that gives you also nice pictures. So this is also one, um, one important component. Um, so here you have um, depicted uh, a convolutional neural network, right? So you have uh, your convolutional filters, you have your nonlinearities, and you have your pooling, and this repeats over and over again for different layers. And in the deconfnet, um, you're going to try to um, undo all of these operations. So you're going to have um, a deconvolution, or, um, a com or let's say it's implemented as a convolution of um, the... Um, um, the, the vertically and horizontally switch um, convolutional filter, so I will, I will tell you a bit more later. Um, the nonlinearity is kept exactly the same, the rectified linear unit, and then your, the most important operation is actually the unpooling. So if in the pooling you actually went from this size to a smaller size by taking, for example, um, the max locations, now you have to go from a smaller size to a bigger size. And so you have to make some design decisions here. And so um, the ampling operation, what it actually does is um, when you're doing the normal max pooling, you store the locations in which you took the maximums. So you see, for example, here that the maximum in this yellow area was located here. So you store this location. The maximum in the red area was located here. So you store this location, so on and so forth. And so when you actually go back um, to the deconfnet and you reach this level here, you have these values that you get from your deconfnet, and you know exactly where to put them because you have the locations stored from when you did the convolution. And so you take these values that you get from the deconfnet and you place them in the exact same locations. Um, now the thing is that, um, so, so this trick of, the, of storing the, the maximum locations for the unpooling is also used, for example, in autoencoders. So it's one type of upsampling, um, or one way of doing the upsampling. And what it does in the case of the autoencoders is it keeps the structures quite well. So if you have edges in certain parts of the image, 
uh, putting the maximum again in the same position is going to most likely keep the edges also in that position. So this is also a good technique that is applied um, in, other, in other cases, not just for visualization. So um, for the uh, for the nonlinear um, for the nonlinearities, uh, we're going to use still the ReLU. So we're still interested in having these positive values for visualization. So having um, the exact same shape for uh, the confnet and the deconfnet is actually good for us. And finally, we have um, the deconvolution operation. Um, so the deconvolution operation, again, it's not like an autoencoder where you want to learn um, the convolutional filter here. We still want to do a convolution, but we want to uh, mimic what would happen if we undo the convolution that happened on the other side of the network. So here we did some convolution. We learned this filter already. And here we want to undo this operation. And what we essentially do is um, we, um, so we are going to use the horizontally and vertically flipped um, filter from uh, the conf uh, channel. And um, this is because you actually want to find which of the inputs influence your outputs. So of course, um, if we have here a convolutional filter where uh, let's say it's two by two, let's say the um, yellow position had a very high weight. This means that this yellow position influenced all the operations after it quite a lot. And so when we do the deconvolution, deconvolution, we actually want to place the values properly according to these weights here. Um, I do have the, um, the animations on why it is actually the vertically and horizontally flipped. Um, filter, but I don't think I have time to show you. But So usually I also do it on the Blackboard. I have some slides, so I will also upload them in case you're interested. Uh, but essentially what happens here is you have a convolutional filter, you flip it horizontally and vertically, and this is what you use to perform the deconvolution. Um, so okay, what happens when you actually um, do this operation? So you do the forward pass until layer one, you pass through the deconf net, and then you have um, this nice picture here. So probably um, all of you will have seen this, this type of colors in this type of pictures. And this is um, the corresponding patches that we got from, uh, from the previous type of visualization. And you see that it actually, um, they match quite well. So for example, for the first filter, you see that um, it's activated by these horizontal edges. And indeed, when we extract the nine closest patches, we see that these are all um, these horizontal edges. And the same happens for um, the rest. For example, this green um, sort of flat green patch detector is also activated by, of course, um, green patches and so on. Um, so this is basically what happens with the, with the first layer, right? So you can, you can observe um, all these uh, geometrical features. And basically, this visualization actually um, allowed people to say that in the first layers of a neural network, you're learning these geometrical features. And then you're starting to learn um, object parts and more meaningful compositions. So when you get to layer three, indeed, you see, uh, I don't know if you see it, though, from, uh, with the projector. But you have actually much more complex shapes, like, for example, uh, faces and, and part of the torso. Or um, I think there's also some eyes in there. There are usually eyes in there. And you see, of course, um, that this match with the, um, with the images, with the patches that originally maxi maximally activated um, these particular filters. And you can also do uh, cool things like, for example, seeing how do these filters evolve, right? So during training, as I go from the beginning of my training where my filters are not really distinctive, as I keep training and training, you see that they become actually much more distinctive. And for example, here we can observe that it goes from sort of the, the, the edges or the sketch of a face to a really uh, full face. You have the eye detector, part of a, of a dog face detector, and so on and so forth. And so you can also monitor your training by, 
plotting how the filters evolve and seeing if the filters are jittering, if the filters have some, um, some other sort of problem. And this is essentially what, uh, what the authors did, right? So they took AlexNet, which was pretty much what everyone was using back in the day, and uh, they basically visualized AlexNet. And so they actually saw that the first layer was sort of a, of a mix of low and high frequency information. So um, I think I have it here. So you can see here that um, the first layer, so AlexNet has a particular architecture, and you have these, these operations that you would never see nowadays uh, in, a, in a ConfNet. And what this actually results in, it's not by surprise that this um, is not used anymore, but this is because um, you see that the, the filter res responses are sort of a mix of high frequency information, so all these patterns um, also mix with parts of the filters that are not really active, that are really uniform, that are just detecting, you know, like, um, basically white walls or, or green patches. And so what they said is, well, um, first of all, the, the mid frequencies um, are not really covered. So what we're going to do is we're going to change from these um, 11 by 11 filters to 7 by 7 filters. And then what you can do with visualization is you can observe what actually happens to the filters. And you can see then that many more of the filters become active and there are many more patterns that are being covered also uh, by just having this small change. And also the mid frequencies are much better covered now. And this was just a change that they decided to do based purely on visualization. So um, another thing that they observe is that um, in the second layer, um, you had these aliasing effects. And this is because AlexNet also had this really large stripe because GPUs were not so big at the time, so it tried to reduce the size really aggressively. And so um, if you actually use the original stripe 4 of AlexNet, um, you see, this is hard to see, but you see here that you have this aliasing effect, so you have these sort of squares uh, all over the, uh, the activations. And when you change actually to a stride of two, these become much smoother. So maybe um, you can watch this um, once you get the hands on the PPT. Um, but essentially, again, this change was done by using purely visualization. And so now your question might be, okay, well, now I get prettier prettier activation pictures, but did I gain anything in terms of classification? And it actually turns out that by just doing these tiny changes, they improve classification by 2% or 2 percentage points, um, which is actually, it might not seem so much, but people make full papers out of 2 percentage points. Um, so doing this by just using visualization is actually quite remarkable. So let's say the takeaway message to, would be to actively use visualization, especially if you're using a new architecture or um, a new problem where um, your data might not be distributed like, um, like natural images are. And so, um, so the first way of, of actually visualizing the features is what I've explained now. So using the deconfnet and uh, finding these parts of the image where the filter responds to and um, and enhancing them through the deconf net and getting them back to the, um, to the image space to visualize them. Um, but there's actually another way, and that is by using uh, gradient ascent. And this essentially means that, um, so if you're doing the optimization with gradient descent, this is sort of the opposite. And what you want to do actually is you want to generate a synthetic image that maximizes um, one particular filter. So what do I mean by that? Um, so let's say that I have, um, I want to maximize the score of a particular class. So I want to ma maximize the score of, let's say, the class dog. And um, this, um, this is the direct output of the fully connected layer, so before the softmax layer. And this is going to be the score of the class dog for a particular image. And uh, we're going to have always a regularizer to get prettier pixel, pre prettier pictures, uh, but the important thing is um, this part here. And so now we're not optimizing the network, right? Our network is fixed. What we're optimizing is for the image. What we're going to change here is the image. And I want to find an image that maximizes the score of dog. 
So this might seem a bit counterintuitive, but um, you will see what I mean here. So how do I go about this is um, I get again a trained CNN. So I don't want to actually um, train the CNN during this process. Um, so it is important to note that the mean of the training images was subtracted to all images, as is the common practice for uh, CNN training. But this is important because now what we're going to do is we're going to start with a zero image. And we're going to make a pass through the CNN. And then we look at the score before the softmax layer for the class C, so for my class dog. And now I say, oh, okay. Um, and now my goal is um, to make, um, so to use optimization in the same way that I use backpropagation. But now the goal is actually um, to change the image so as to um, maximize this score. So my loss function is clear, right? I want to maximize this score here. I can use backpropagation all the way to the image, and I make a tiny update on the image based on my gradient. So the same as I would do for the neural network, but instead of updating all the weights here, I'm going to update my image. And of course, I do this repeatedly. And uh, for visualization, I'm going to add the training mean image. Otherwise, visualization is not so nice. And uh, what happens essentially is that you get this, time of cra this type of crazy images, where essentially you start from a zero image, you try to maximize the class Husky, and then you start hallucinating Huskies all over the image. So this is essentially what, what you would get out of this. Some of them look better, some of them look worse. I think the bell pepper is one of the best one and one of the ones that is also used more uh, because you can really see these um, five or six bell peppers that sort of appear from the, from the zero image. And again, this is, this is an optimization process, right? So I have used backpropagation, but instead of updating the, the CNN, which is fixed throughout this process, I have updated the image based on the gradient. Um, so these images don't look um, super nice. So some people actually said, well, we can actually um, improve the visualization with a better regularization. And so they propose different regularization. Uh, they clip various here and there, um, nothing too interesting. But the point is that now you can see much prettier images where you see flamingos flying around all over the place, pelicans, um, some kind of snake and so on and so forth. And um, if you actually want to test how this visualization looks, so here you have the link. This is, um, I think, a pretty, uh, pretty nice link. And you can, um, as far as I remember, you can uh, visualize any network that you want. So you can get um, these pictures for any network you want. Um, but you can also do um, other crazy things, and this is where actually um, Deep Dream comes, uh, comes into play. Um, so until now, what we did was we synthesized an image to maximize a specific feature. So let's say I want to maximize um, flamingo features. Um, I synthesize an image that maximizes the score of flamingo. And now what I want to do is I want to amplify individual feature activations in some layer of the network. So I don't want to go all the way forward into the score. I want to stop somewhere in the middle and amplify that. And so again, what you do is you take an image, you fit it into a network, and then I choose a layer. And now what I want to maximize is the activations of that layer. Whatever they are, I don't care if these are dogs, if these are cars. But what it's telling me is if you have um, a, a layer that is highly activated and this layer is responsible for dog detection, then just amplify this effect and show me more dogs. And so um, this, is, this is done in a, in a bit of a tricky way. Um, so basically, like in the deconf net, we're going to do the forward pass up to a layer L. And then what you're going to do is you're going to compute the, um, you're going to take the activations of that layer and you're going to use them as gradients for backpropagation. So essentially what this means is that um, if the dog filter is really largely activated, the gradients for that are going to be also really large. Because basically what you're doing is saying now gradients equal activations. So 
So large activations mean large gradients, small activations mean small gradients. And I do the same as before, I backpropagate and I update the image. Uh, but now I get sort of a different effect. So if I um, do the forward pass only until the first layers, then I'm going to get these um, images with sort of um, basic features enhanced. So edges enhanced, circles enhanced, things like that. Um, but when, when I go deeper into, um, into, the, into the neural network, then of course um, these layers are responsible for detecting full parts or, or, or whole objects. So we're going to start to see um, more objects as we optimize this image. So for example, if we take this image as input um, and we actually go onto some deep layer, then you start, um, well, deep dreaming some, some birds. Usually most of the animals have two heads, left and right. Um, so it's, it's really nice freaky stuff. And of course you can do um, sort of your own style transfer, right? So you can also take the, the style image of before, put the dream on top, and then you get, uh, you get really nice pictures. And um, someone also applied it on a video of a, of a grocery store. And well, they got like um, animals all over the place and um, really funny stuff. So the thing is that um, uh, ImageNet contains a lot of dogs and a lot of cats. So usually when you do this with a pre-trained um, network on ImageNet, then you get dogs and cats all over the place, even though this is a grocery store. Um, so what's the time? Yeah, over? Okay. So um, the, um, the other thing that I want to talk about was TSNE. Um, I did not want to go any way into detail on how this works, so I'm not going to explain it, but bottom line is that um, you get really nice visualizations for clustering of your network, and any network that you have, if it doesn't cluster elements well, then it doesn't work well. So usually the type of visualizations that you want to do with TSNE are these, where you see that similar objects are clustered into, the, into um, one particular region, and this is also one way that you can use to evaluate your models. And this is integrated into pretty much any visualization tool, um, so you can use it right away. Um, okay, so that's it. Uh, any questions? Yeah, no, 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 no.